verses 21 and 22. Hear now these words. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal. This is the word of the Lord. So Stephanie, my wife, you'll meet her. She'll be here next hour. We were cooking on a Sunday afternoon. We were starting a new diet. It was Whole30. And if you're not familiar with Whole30, it's 30 days of torture. (laughs) It's no carbs, no sugar, no dairy, and no processed foods for 30 days. It was a Sunday afternoon, and we're prepping meals for the week. We're prepping all the breakfasts and two of the lunches. And there's a churning and bubbling and sizzling going on on the burners. The oven is preheating and we're measuring out things like cumin. And we're talking to each other and I'm talking to her about all the ways I'm nervous about the weeks to come, how I'm worried that I'm going to be drained of energy and have headaches and how I'm going to have cravings. And I'm, and I'm just talking to her about how I'm going to satiate those cravings. And she is talking about how excited she is about the diet and how she's really looking forward to this clean, healthy lifestyle. And my son, who was about six and a half at the time, notices that there's a difference in our Sunday morning rhythms and routines and just kind of asks us, what are you guys doing? And so we told him, well, we're prepping food for the week, we're starting a new diet, it's Whole30, and we kind of explained the, the whole thing to him. And he had some follow-up questions, like, you know, what's a carb? What's dairy? Uh, What are processed foods? Luckily, Stephanie was there to answer that question, because I still don't think I know. (laughs) And then he kind of, you know, he's assimilating that, and he's finally asked, like, the question, so why do you do that? And I answer in a very dad way, because we're going to get skinny, buddy. Get healthy, we'll get skinny. Lose some weight. Stephanie has a much better answer. And she talks about how we're going to be, you know, healthier lifestyle, more energy, you know, feel better, and just, just be healthier. And again, he chews on that for a second. And he says, well, we learned that to be healthy, you have to eat your vegetables and exercise. And that was it. <laughs> and my first internal response was that of kind of humorous derision, like, whatever, buddy, like, that is so archaic. Eat your vegetables and exercise? Please, I just downloaded this off the internet. This has to be modern. And I don't want to despair. If you're a keto person or a paleo person or you're a, you're a Whole30 practitioner or you're one of those weird pescatarians, um, I don't want to say that anything you're doing is wrong, but what I realize is that Eating vegetables and exercising is like the pillar that all those different strategies sit on top of. And it's funny to me, it's it's so easy to know about the simple things. There's no big secret, there's no big conspiracy about being healthy. Everybody knows you got to eat right and exercise. That's that's all there is to it. There's, There's no secret there. I can't tell you anything about that that you probably don't already know or haven't already read or saw an infomercial about. But... It's so hard to do. It's so hard to change our lifestyle. This, this pastor friend of mine one time uh, was giving a talk, uh, and, he, and he said, there's only two reasons why people change. And that's you learn enough that you want to, or you hurt enough that you have to. And I can't disagree with that. But in preparation for this conversation with you, I read something else by a guy named Henry Nouwen, and he said this. He says, you don't think your way into a new type of living. You live your way into a new type of thinking. Now, hold on to that. We're going to come back to it. Now, the scripture today was Luke, Luke Luke 10, and our scripture did a great job. But just like vegetables, 
I don't think we can get too much of this, so I'm going to read it to you again. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and to those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now, what happened just before this was Jesus sent out 72 of his followers, and he sent them out to the, the hillsides and the countryside saying, go and teach and preach and heal people and cast out demons, and they went and they did. And they came back full of success in ministry, and they were jazzed as can be. They were, Jesus, you never believe it. We went and did all the things you said to do, and it worked. It worked. Your name, and it worked. And Jesus was jazzed back. In fact, this is the only time in Scripture where it says, Jesus, enjoy with the Holy Spirit. There's other times where Jesus is in joy, and there's other times where Jesus is in the Spirit. This is the only time in Scripture where it's joy in the Spirit. So we know that Jesus was super pumped, super pumped by this going on. I can, I can think of two reasons why this happened. One, he was in ministry, and in ministry, when you see ministry happening, you get excited about it. You know, you take the wins that you can get in ministry. But the other, I think Jesus was a, was a teacher. And so ask any teacher one of the, the real rewards for what they do is when you see uh, the people that you've been teaching and the people that you've been monitoring really come into their own with what you've been giving them and really living it out. And I think Jesus was super excited to see his followers doing that. And he got like a, a preview of the new church that was going to be created. But the first thing that Jesus does, because he's so excited in the Holy Spirit, is he praises the Father. I praise you, Father. But he does it in this weird way. And I have to tell you that I had to chew on this for a little bit because I was really annoyed by this scripture when it said that he hides things from the learned and the wise and revealed things to children. Because, well, I'm a person who values education and likes to think that I value wisdom. And so I was just kind of really annoyed with it. I was really having trouble with it. Like I was chewing on it and just wasn't getting anywhere until I found this quote by a guy named Arnold Bennett. And I want to read this to you because I think it's really, really good. It says this, The only way to write a great book is to write it with the eyes of a child who sees things for the first time. It is possible to be too clever. It is possible to be so learned that in the end we cannot see the wood for the trees. Someone has said that the test of a really great scholar is how much he or she is able to forget. After all, Christianity does not mean knowing all the theories of the New Testament. Still less, it means knowing all the theologies and the Christologies. Christianity does not mean knowing about Christ. It means knowing Christ. And I just want to say that again. Our faith is not about knowing who Christ is. Our faith is about knowing Christ. It's the difference between earthly knowledge and earthly wisdom and heavenly grace. You don't think your way into a new type of living. You live your way into a new type of thinking. Because doing something is better than knowing how to do it. Let's take one of my favorite Whole30 examples, bacon. I love bacon. Bacon is one of my favorite things, and bacon was one of the things on Whole30 that I really, really enjoyed. I still enjoy bacon, but I can have it on Whole30. Now, eating bacon is better than knowing how to eat bacon, right? <laughs> I, it just is. I, I don't want to judge you by the way you eat bacon. If you eat it three strips at a time, I'm good with that. If you eat it on a burger, I'm good with that. If you eat it on a salad, okay, I'm good with that. And then... If you eat it crushed up on top of a maple glazed donut, I'm really good with that one. I broke all the rules of Whole30 in one bite. It was kind of amazing. 
Yeah, I did that. Let's, let's talk about it. But bacon, knowing how to eat it, isn't as good as eating it. Or let's take driving. I really like driving. If you ask any 14 or 15-year-old what they're excited about in their near future, half of them are going to tell you they're excited about driving. They're excited about the freedom that driving has and gives them. But 100% of them will tell you that they know how to drive. You know what I'm saying? Now, the first time I drove was in the third grade. My mother had parts uh, in the street uh, right outside my grandparents' home. And for some reason, we had to move the car from the street to the driveway. I quickly volunteered, saying that I could do this. So we went out to the car. It's my mom's old Pontiac. And I sat in the driver's seat. My grandfather was in the passenger seat. And again, I had seen people drive. I'd seen my mother drive. I'd never done it before. So I, I do all the steps that I know to do. I turn the car on, uh, you know, put on my seatbelt because I was going to be super mature. Uh, I turn the wheel, hold down the brake, and put it in D. Thank goodness it was an automatic. And if you guys don't know, it, it was a gravel road, and it was an old graded gravel road, so the, like the gravel makes this kind of mound that you have to get over, and two of the wheels were on the low part, and two of the wheels were on the high part. And I knew I had to turn the car around, so I had turned the wheel really far so I could make a nice tight turn. And so I'm ready to go, and I know that if I just let go of the brake, the car will move. So I let go of the brake. The wheels are going uphill, so nothing happens. That's okay. I know what to do. I'm just going to touch the gas just a little bit, and the car kind of moves a little bit. Okay, no problem. I'm going to touch the gas even more. Hit the gas a little bit more, and I go a little bit forward more, and I almost make it. Oh, the car comes back and rocks down to the drill vision. And so I realize that my grandfather next to me is also realizing something, and that's I don't know what I'm doing. So I have one more shot, and in my third grade mind, I know the solution. So I hit the gas strong, and I see a face right here, they know what's happening. The car wheels are turned, I hit the gas full force, we get over the mound of gravel, but then the car is going sideways across the street very fast. It's okay, I'm a third grader, I know the solution to this, and I hit the brake really hard. And of course, we go forward, the car spins out on the gravel, and my grandfather, I'm still alive, so he didn't kill me, but he basically tells me, hey, stop, put it in park, get out of the car. And I'm, I'm upset now. No, I just got over the big hurdle. I know the rest. I'm mad. I can't believe it. He didn't give me a chance. It's not fair, all the things that a third grader says in defense of himself. And my grandfather puts the car in the driveway. He walks up to me and says, okay, let's go. And I didn't know what that meant. Now, it could have, mean, could have meant that I had to go tell my mom that I almost wrecked a car. Luckily, that's not what it meant. It could have meant that I was going to get punished by my grandfather, and I really didn't want that to happen. That only happened a couple times in my life, and I'm still scared of it. But what it meant was he put me in his 84 newish Silverado, took me out to a country road, taught me how to drive, and let me drive around for about half an hour. And I still remember that as one of the, the greatest times I had with my grandfather. And I still love driving, and I still love driving trucks. In fact, I was so excited when I bought one a couple years back. Because doing is so much better than knowing how to do something. Doing it is so much better than knowing how to. Now, I worked, I worked with Abel this week, and as we're talking about praise and thanksgiving, our time together is sacred. And Abel plans it out, plans it out well. But, and prayer is part of this process, and I got permission for him to say this. But his knowledge is good, but it's not as good as knowing how to do it. It's not as good as actually doing the praise and the thanksgiving that we're commanded to do in scriptures. But here's the deal. It starts with knowledge, and it becomes something that we do. But then we keep doing it, it becomes something 
that we're doing. But while we're doing it, it's doing something in us. And in the end, it stops being something that we're doing and starts to become something that we're becoming. And in the end, it's something that we're being. It starts with knowledge, but only through the, the process of doing it does the, the, the process of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord really change us. Because just like in sports, practice makes perfect, it's the same with praise and thanksgiving. The more we do it, the more we see in the world around us, the creation that God gave us, ways that we can praise and give thanksgiving to Him. The more we do it, the more we have the ability to do it, and the more we see that it's needed in our lives. So how do we do it? Yes, um, Psalm 86.12 says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and will glorify your name forever. And that's how we start, by glorifying God. And we do that by taking God with us in all the situations of our life. In every moment of our life, we can take God with us. The second is we reject the idea that we're going to take any of the glory that belongs to God. And the third is by making God the priority relationship in our lives. We don't think our way into a new type of living. We live our way into a new type of thinking. I'm going to close with this, you guys. This is Philippians 4, 4 through 7a. Now, this is the Message Bible. And usually with the message, I'm, I'm hit or miss. Sometimes I think he hits it on the nose, sometimes not. This one, I think he, he has it down. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them, helping them to see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up at any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. And let petitions and praise shape your worries into prayers. Amen. Why don't you pray with me?